okay, so we have probably one of the most adventurous, exciting, information-packed shows that I have ever done. We have a very interesting new history that has come our way as a result of information that is leaked to us from people working for what is called the SSP or Secret Space Program. Now what is that? The Secret Space Program is why nobody went back to the moon since like 1970. That's a long time. Oh well yeah, been there, done that. Don't need to go back, we figured it all out. We know there's moon dust up there, it's all good. No, 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 no. I want to welcome you to an idea. I want you to give this idea a habitat in your mind. Because with the idea comes freedom from the stricture of ignorance that has been deliberately put upon you by those who do not wish their control to be usurped. Boy, those are a lot of SAT words. <laughs> the secret space program is what happened as a result of things like the Nazis developing flying saucer technology in the 1930s, which came about in part through the work of Victor Schauberger. You probably have heard of him before since you're all a very educated audience. It came about through a liaison that was created telepathically with extraterrestrials through the Vril Society, people like Maria Orsich, channeled these Anunnaki beings, and there was, in fact, some of, one of my insiders told me, very credible insider, and I have over a dozen of them who are really good, that there was a meeting in the Himalayas in, the in about 1936 with these Anunnaki, and that a treaty with what became the Nazis was signed. And there was a technology exchange and an information exchange that allowed the Nazis to achieve anti-gravity spacecraft that actually worked and pretty quickly once you have anti-gravity spacecraft what else you're gonna have is the ability to travel outside the earth and go take a look around now here's one of the really really cool things that we find out that you're gonna hear in this talk is that our solar system had some very very interesting people come through a long time ago about five million years ago is their estimate and they really built it out there is a whole amazing amount of ancient technology in our solar system. There are build-outs all over the place. And one of the things that I like to do, and I take this very seriously, I joke about it, but this is serious, I am deliberately disclosing things that could get me killed in front of this audience so that once it's out, it's out. You'll notice I did not announce that I was going to do this until this morning on my website because these people work fast. Okay, so I do believe that the information I'm going to put here could get me in trouble, but I also believe that you need to know the truth, and that's more important than my physical safety. Thank you. What are the big questions? Who are we? Why are we here? Where did we come from? And where are we going? What is the big picture? Where is this all going? That is ultimately something that, for me, actually came about through this book beginning in 1978. I was born in 1973. I was five years old when I got this book. And believe it or not, my grandmother bought me this book, and she, is a she was a fundamentalist Christian and a rabid fundamentalist Christian. But she thought that if she got me this book, that it would make me want to read. And it sure as heck did. <laughs> This is from Reader's Digest. I did not understand a lot of what I was reading, but the pictures were really cool. Now, what you're seeing here is right at the very back of the book, and this it's a big, nice, thick, two-inch two book, and right at the end, there's the last chapter, section five. It's called The World of Tomorrow, and if you can see it there, it says Enigma of the UFO, and that's the first time in the whole freaking book that they mention UFOs, right at the end. And I saw these pictures right here. And this was my first exposure to UFOs. Now, as a child in 1978, the idea that these pictures could have been fake didn't even occur to me. I just assumed that these people were writing about this, and it was true. The idea of it being debunked never occurred to me. Well, 
I was so excited about the idea that people were coming here from other planets that I just tripped out like crazy when I, when I read this part of the book. And I kept going back to this. I literally, as a child, spent hours and hours and hours looking at this picture and just kind of fantasizing about who are they? How did they get here? Where did they come from? What is this thing? That was a long time ago. And then this thing tripped me out even more. Looking into the future, a conversation with science writer Isaac Asimov, and it says right here, the great trek, as, you know, it says something to the effect of that humanity is going to expand itself beyond the Earth, and that what we're going to end up doing at that point, when we use up the Earth's own resources, is we will start to hollow out asteroids and live inside of asteroids in fully habitable worlds. Now, I, I'm literally not kidding, and, and I just scanned this this morning from the same book that I used to spend so many hours looking at. I tripped out on this so many times on this picture that to put it into the show now just makes me feel really warm inside. It, <laughs> it really does. It turns out that almost, well, we don't know if it's all, but a significant majority of the moons and large asteroids in our solar system have this type of build-out inside them. But the thing is, they don't have an opening like that. There's not going to be some big gate that you can get in through. They fly through the rock using a technology that allows them to permeate matter temporarily. This was a very highly advanced civilization, as you're going to see, the people that did this were extremely tall. We're talking 70 to even 100 feet in height. Extremely tall. So what I'm saying to you is that there are moons all over the solar system that will have this kind of architecture built inside them, and I'm going to show you some of the pictures that suggest that that's what's going on. Here is a NASA diagram of some of the current potentially habitable planets that they found that are like the Earth, that people could be living on, that we could go move to, except there's probably people already there who'd be pretty darn upset about us showing up and wanting to chemtrail and build SUVs. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want that. So there's a lot of them right nearby. We don't have to go very far. And then here you see our night sky consists of a small selection of the very brightest and nearest stars within that tiny red circle in the, in the Milky Way. That's all the stars we see when we look at the sky. Everything else is much farther away. So if you have a planet that was born 8 billion years ago, that's a significant jump ahead of the Earth. If you look at the time between the formation of that planet and the present day, that means that that planet was at our current level of intelligence and technology at the time that our planet was born. And that means that that planet could have had three and a half billion years to develop beyond the technology that we have right now. Woo! -hoo! So what if our solar system has been inhabited for five million years? Well, it turns out that once you get into the space program, this is all standard knowledge. ETs are all over the place. There's lots and lots of groups that have come to the Earth, but they all follow something that in Star Trek was called the Prime Directive. They're not allowed to show us that they exist because it would interfere with free will. We need to think that we're alone and isolated and that there's no God and that there's no extraterrestrials and that we're just trying to figure this thing out in the dark. Because if we knew that they existed, what would happen? We'd fall to our knees and worship them as gods, and we wouldn't be having the opportunity to cry at night in the dark, oh, nobody loves me, and there's no universe. There's no higher beings. I'm just all alone. No, you're not alone. But you have an illusion that's been constructed that a lot of ETs are doing a lot of work to uphold, and that illusion maintains the idea of separation. It's a good thing that we have the opportunity to feel pain. It's a good thing that we have the opportunity to not know the truth. Because then there's plenty of things to learn. If we learned all this stuff a long time ago, it would get boring. So as you discover these things, it's all these ahas, all these cosmic moments. And remember, 
The choice has to be made in the dark. The choice of, are you going to love people, or are you going to try to manipulate people and control them for your own gain? That's what the Law of One says the point of being in our reality is. you got to make that choice. So this, again, is all stuff that comes out of the Law of One material, and now it has been heavily validated by what we've heard. Now, the Law of One doesn't quite say this in so many words, but here's what we have heard. Now, this information actually came to me in part through the highest level insider who's been talking to Richard C. Hoagland, who's been out there ever since the 80s talking about all this stuff. And this guy actually was authorized by the United States government to leak this to me and other people who are out there as UFO figures because apparently the powers that <clears throat> were now feel that it's time for us to know this. And I've taken the ball and run with it. And then after he gave me all this information, these two brand new insiders from the space program showed up. And between them and all of their friends, I got a lot more than what Hoagland's insider was willing to give me. So here's the story from Hoagland's insider, who's been talking to Hoagland ever since he showed up in the 80s. And everybody else, I've put it all together. And these are people who... Overall, there's up to 100 different points of correlation between these different stories, and I withhold a lot from the Internet because there are unscrup unscrupulous individuals out there who will take this and say that they're insiders and then want to go out there and bilk people out of their money and say, well, you know, I'm going to do this for you, I'm going to do that for you, buy into the bonds that will be worth something when the Federal Reserve collapses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I have to withhold a lot of stuff because otherwise everybody's going to say they know it and how can I vet people out? So I've vetted out these guys and I've not released most of what they said. This is a big new data download. And so we're going to look from here on out and see how many people all of a sudden know all the things that I just told you tonight. Right? That's going to be a telling clue of whether they're real or not. They suddenly change the story. What do we find out? We find out that because of the unique nurturing energy that's in our solar system, this is used as a sort of a rehab colony for negative groups. They were banished here by ETs from other worlds, other solar systems out there that said, you guys are too warlike. Get the heck out of here. We're sending you over there to rehabilitate. We're going to put you on a nice desert island. So we're Australia. We're Botany Bay, OK? <laughs> Our solar system was a prison colony. Now, they didn't, the, the good beings that did this didn't think of it that way. But the people who got sent here had a lot of enemies, and they pissed a lot of people off. Now, these original people had spent many, many, many millennia in space. And the longer you stay in space as a human being, because one of the things we learn is that everybody that is an extraterrestrial is some kind of hominid. They got a head, they got arms and legs. They could look a lot different than us. Every type of life that we see on Earth, whether it's birds, whether it's fish, whether it's reptiles, insects, every type of life on Earth has beings that look human or human-like that are derived from that type of life. So you have avian humans. You have simian humans that actually look more like monkeys than we do. You have some that have faces like felines, some that have faces like birds. They actually look like a bird head on a human body. Some of them look like reptilian heads on human bodies. Some of them have insect heads on human bodies. All these different types are out there. And it seems that different types that look more alike tend to stick together more. And that includes the reptilians, which happen to be the bad guys in the story. It sounds cliche. It just happens to be true. So these people have been floating around in the cosmos for a really long time. And they got very highly evolved to such an extent that they communicate by micro voltage changes in the glow on their face that's like broadband internet so they can communicate much faster than speaking and that's why for people like us to try to talk to these guys it's almost impossible they can't even imagine trying to speak in regular speech like at the speed that we do it would be way too slow so here's a list that guy down there on the bottom left is us that's six means six feet in height these are all different types of giant skeletons that have been found on Earth in terms of their heights. Goes up to 36 feet. So there have been certain burial sites in which 36-foot skeletons have been found. 
there's the different lineup of what we got. So you could see some of these giants would be extremely tall and threatening to us as little, little guys there on the left. But now these folks are called in the insider world, the world of the Illuminati, they call them the progenitors. Those are the guys that are 70 to 100 feet tall. That would be a 70-foot humanoid there on the right. And there <laughs> is us. Now, what I'm telling you is, yeah, everybody's standing up. You see that? It's a dramatic moment. I love it. <laughs> that little pipsqueak over there on the left is the height that we have now. Now imagine that our space program, we start building s ships that can travel out of the solar system. You know that they exist. You know that they got the Roswell crash, right? You know they reverse engineered it. You know about Area 51. Don't you think they'd fly into space? Don't you think they'd want to see some stuff out there once they got out there? Guess what they found? They found all kinds of build-outs inside moons and inside asteroids predominantly where the entire room is built for people that are that large. Now imagine walking into a room where the countertops alone are like 40 feet high. All the original equipment has been removed, probably because of you know, scavengers, bone pickers. So a lot of what we find out there is big, giant, empty rooms that are massive in size with very massive doors that are like 100 feet tall. There's still, in some cases, machines that still work inside these facilities built by these very large extraterrestrials they call the progenitors. As I've been saying, the majority, according to the insiders I've spoken to, the majority of all the moons in our solar system have some degree of ancient bases inside them for people that are very, very tall. And in many cases, those bases have then been reoccupied later on because beings like these progenitors will come through and they'll build things out, they'll live here for a while, and then they mothball it and they go somewhere else. And then maybe for them, what might be just a few years, for us could be millions of years, they eventually come back and they reoccupy the facility again. So these facilities are ready to go. So in a lot of cases, we just fly in and we start building out what's already been built there and it saves us an awful lot of time. So these are some selected moons of our solar system with the Earth there placed for scale. You can see there's some really large stuff. Uh, the moons of Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto, pretty large. And you can see Saturn has a bunch of really large moons in the middle there. Uranus has several really large moons. Neptune has one really big one called Titan. And then you have uh, some asteroids that are pretty large, et cetera, et cetera. So let's start from how our progenitors, as they're called, came in. They came in, and Neptune has a moon system, which I'm showing you now. And this is just to give you the sense of some of the stuff that's out there. All these different moons, or at least most of them, from what I've been told from different people, and I got to combine it all together, most of these moons have settlements on them, gigantic rooms inside. Uranus has a very robust moon system, tons of moons around Uranus. They even just found two new ones, as you can see in this diagram. And a lot of these moons apparently have bases inside them of some magnitude. And these are some of the larger moons of Uranus. Again, probably extensive facilities inside most of these places. Now, Uranus's moon Miranda is a very curious example in which perhaps some of the ancient build-out is still visible to us because do you notice that strange boomerang shape on the moon? Do you see that? Well, let's take a closer look at that. That's actually what we see. That is Miranda. So there is something very bizarre there. Here it is tilted on a different angle. Now, this looks like it could, that, that, that is a ridge or an escarpment that you're seeing there on the left. It's the tallest ridge in the solar system of any of the moons. There's a clear geometric structure there, which you can see based on the triangles that I put in on the right. Now, is it possible that we are seeing the underlying geometric structure that was built inside this moon and that over the millennia, as the dust has gotten worn off by asteroid collisions, we're starting to see the superstructure that's hidden inside. And also over here, we see very clear geometric shapes. Again, why wouldn't they build a geodesic inside? Now, this is what I've been told by one of the insiders, one of the original insiders, was that 
some of these moons, the entire inside has an atmosphere. And there is something like a geometric object, like those platonic solids, and you actually see trees and lakes, and there's an artificial sun, and you can fly around inside that moon, and you can pilot the moon anywhere you want to go, and it's like a whole world built inside of it. That's an advanced, obviously very advanced technology that apparently is all over the place. Now Saturn has a whole bunch of moons. Look at all these moons. And as I said, probably the majority, based on what many insiders have told me, the majority of these moons have some kind of build out in them already. And we have been out there and investigated a majority of this and looked for what we can find. Now, Saturn's moon Mimas, which is sort of closer to it, meaning it's gonna be warmer there, is a curiously similar shape to the Death Star, and this was actually mentioned by the Daily Mail, which is probably part of a programmed disclosure. Now, you see that it actually looks a lot like something that George Lucas put into his movie. How did he get this idea? Well, maybe he got it from somebody on the inside, because it looks pretty darn similar. And remember, this is most likely an artificial world inside something that looks like a moon, which is exactly what the Death Star was in Star Wars. It even has similar structures on the surface. And if that's not weird enough, based on any conventional knowledge of physics, what we should see inside that moon is that the heat is going to be the strongest on the part of the moon that faces the planet, right? So that the planet's radiant heat is warming up the moon there. What we actually see is exactly the opposite. We see that the part that's facing Saturn is colder and the part away from Saturn is warmer. And look at how it's got this sort of Pac-Man shape. Now imagine, if you will, that this is one of those moons that has an entire civilization already built inside of it and everybody is living inside the yellow part. And then most of the hollow interior of the moon would be the sky for them. And then where that circle is, as you can see on the bottom, would be approximately where the sun, the fake sun would be. You could have a whole world of people living inside this object, hiding from their enemies. Because these people, remember, were a prison colony. They were in trouble and they were sent here to reform. And they also had enemies and they were really worried about being attacked. So then we have another moon around Saturn that also has this very strange temperature anomaly. Same thing, Tethys. Again, it doesn't seem to make sense, but maybe one explanation is that this is where the civilization is and that it's still in operation. Apparently there's a lot of people here in our solar system even now. And so the mainstream media, of course, calls it Pac-Man, right? Just to try to make light of it, but then they're getting you to ask questions. And Blinky is nowhere to be seen. <laughs> Oh my goodness gracious. Now also around Saturn we have Enceladus and this also is a very, very curious thing. Now on the left, we're going to come back to this in a little while, is a s weird square that's on the moon. But then the one on the right is this weird square that's on Saturn's moon Enceladus. Squares are not supposed to show up in nature. But it would be something you'd expect to see in the case of an ancient geometric build out. So that's very curious. Now. What happens when we look at this curiously square area? Well, the curiously square area has curious heat that's not supposed to be there in exactly the square shape. You see that down there on the bottom right? And then it's not what's supposed to be there. When we look at it up close, it has a striated structure, which would totally be what you'd expect if this particular habitat is built to have a series of long hallways so that everybody gets windows. So that it's not all just one big giant room, but that you have these developments. Now that looks like an artificial and intelligently built structure to me because you got straight lines and 90 degree turns, suggesting a massive, massive station has been built inside and it's down at the polar region and that's where all the heat is because that's where everybody's keeping the bills paid and keeping the heat on. Now, one of the insiders, when I showed this to him, he told me that that image looks exactly like what we see when we use various classified means such as LIDAR, radar, and thermal collage to look at actual underground facilities here on Earth. It's a very, very similar pattern to the underground bases that we have. 
Now, Saturn also has another moon, Iapetus, that has some weird stuff going on. And it's the one that is, let me make sure I'm right here, yep. It's the one that's on that really, really wide arc. So it goes far away from Saturn, as you can see right here. There's Iapetus. Now, this is some photographs that were taken from Cassini, which swung by uh, several years ago. And this was work done by Richard Hoagland back in 2006, where he looks at Iapetus and says, oh my gosh, it's not a perfect sphere. It's all funny looking. And it has this ridge exactly along the midpoint along the equator. What the heck is that thing doing there? Moons are not supposed to have a gigantic ridge that goes across the entire central axis of the middle of the planet, but if you superimpose your latitude and longitude lines, it's right there. That is exactly what we would expect if this thing has been built like a clamshell that's got two halves and it's all artificial inside, okay? So that's not something we would expect, and there's even more weird fringe benefits with this moon. When we look at how the sun reflects across its surface, we see very strange geometric oddities. It is not a nice smooth curve. It's got geometric straight line dents on it. Check that out. I was really impressed with Richard when he did this, and I think that the insider guy that I'm in contact with leaked some of this to him, as well as him doing it through his own work. So you can see that there is a geometric structure almost like because it's so old that the, it's kind of collapsed in on itself and the original parts of the moon that were all dust have probably blown away or gotten impacted by asteroid collisions, things like that. And then as the sunlight plays across the surface of Iapetus, which remember still has that central equator as well, you see different types of straight line geometry. That is not what it should look like. But that is what we would expect if it's a gigantic base of massive proportions like the Death Star, which was being rebuilt in Return of the Jedi. So there it is again. Now, uh, this was Richard's conception of what it might look like inside underneath all the dirt. And I don't think that's too far from the truth. I think that's basically what these look like and that was what he was nudged to think by the insider. And the idea here is that at some point, this group, which probably had a population of hundreds of billions of people at the apex of their civilization, their enemies came back and they got wiped out. Now, another thing I want to show you before we get into that story is this particular asteroid. It's very compelling, 433 Eros. It's kind of shaped like a potato. And this is from February 14th, 2000. And what we're going to see here is a NASA page, September 26, 2000, called Square Craters. <laughs> oh, right, yeah, because asteroids have square craters. No, they don't. <laughs> They're not supposed to. But look at what we're seeing here. You can actually see at least four very clear squares in a straight line. Now, think about what this probably means. These are gigantic square rooms built for people, because remember, look at the scale there, that's 500 meters. So these are really, really large, because remember, a meter is three feet. So we're looking at 1,500 feet across, and actually more than that. So these are like 2,000 feet across, these two large squares, from one side to the other. So we're dealing with almost, it's about a half a mile wide from one side to the other inside these squares. That's a big frickin' room. But if you're 70 foot tall, it's not going to be as big. And what probably has happened is that over the millennia, the roof has collapsed in on these facilities. So now you're seeing a totally abnormal, non-natural square geometry. And if you look there on the right, you see there's two more little squares as well that also uh, appear to be artificial in nature. And those are just the most obvious ones that they're allowing us to see. Now, Mars, apparently, also the moons Phobos and Deimos are totally in hollow inside, and that's why they look so lumpy, because they have really collapsed over time, because most of that hollowness hasn't supported the external structure, so originally they were more round, and they've sort of collapsed. This apparently at one time was like a holding facility or a base that had, it was like a hangar for large amounts of aircraft, a very large size that were stored inside of it. Now notice here, 
you see these geometric striations. You see vertical lines going top to bottom and then vertical lines going left to right and they're at 9 degree angles. That is probably the remainder of the original superstructure that was holding it all together. And that original superstructure, again, is just showing up as some of the stress lines and stress marks that we see on this moon. So you can kind of see now the 9 degree angles of the original the ribbing, these are the, the, the original supports that were built inside before it shrank. Now this is really bizarre. According to the insiders I'm in contact with, the ancient progenitors built out the inside of Phobos and then more recent ET groups have colonized our solar system. And this was one of the first places they went because they could see right away by looking with the penetrating radar inside that it was all hollow and that it's square inside. And in fact, European Space Agency, ESA, had found that same data through some of their space probes and they told Richard Hoagland, they leaked it to him before they went public with it, and then of course the whole story got silenced and suppressed and you never heard about it again. Buzz Aldrin, one of the Apollo astronauts, mentioned that there was a monolith on Phobos on C-SPAN. And this is a shot from that actual clip. I'm not going to play it here, but you can watch it on YouTube. And he says, what if we go back to Phobos and try to find out what this thing is? Well, there it is down there on the bottom. Look at the long shadow that this thing is casting. That shouldn't be there. And this is Efren Palermo, one of Hoagland's old associates, showing how this monolith would have been casting that shadow. And this was his uh, drawing of, uh, or actually a mock-up, a photograph of what he thinks it originally must look like. Now, again, what we've heard from insiders is that this was something built by newer groups that were a lot shorter than 70 feet tall that came in and used that as a basic door that they could find to try to get inside the thing. This was where they would land and where they had their equipment and so forth and probably has a, it's like a whole skyscraper type of thing they built on there with all different rooms and stuff inside of it. I don't think it really looks like this. It's probably a lot more technological. And of course, this brings us to the infamous monuments of Mars, which appear to be some of the survivors of what we're going to see became the asteroid belt. And after that, which was originally a planet, that's one of the things everybody on the inside tells you is there was a super Earth in our solar system. Now some people call it Electra, some people call it Tiamat. That's the two different names for it I've heard from the space program. After this planet exploded, and we'll get to that in a minute, the survivors apparently settled on Mars. And Mars had been largely damaged because Mars was an Earth-like moon orbiting this super Earth, but it still had enough ocean and atmosphere left that it could be lived on predominantly through underground bases and they were able to rebuild it for a while and built up a civilization. Now this is the original picture from NASA frame 35A16 I believe it is or 35A73 that shows what appears to be a face and this has been widely attacked but as you can see here it clearly is casting a shadow it looks very much like a face with a headdress on it and then, as this is one of Hoagland's, uh, he just basically cropped around the original NASA photograph. You see the face over there on the right, which very much looks like a face. And then on the left, we have this whole crazy looking city of things that look very much like pyramids. Now let's take a closer look at that. That to me is very much not a natural formation. So this is the result of people building pyramids. And then, as I showed you in the previous slide, the face is right over there, right where the sun sets. So they could watch the sunset over this monument, which is probably a monument to one of their leaders. So in 1998, Mark Carlotto did a geometric projection from the side where you can actually see really clearly the, the, the huge structure of that face which again is very obviously an intelligently built structure and then you got this city of pyramids and then notice what you got over there on the bottom right there is another pyramid down there that's actually five-sided you can see it here in this picture not very well but it's right down there in the middle 
So let's take a look at that one now. That's what it looks like from the top view, and that's what it looks like from the side. Again, this object, they estimate, is a mile and a half wide. It's enormous, and it's big enough that it could potentially hold a billion people inside. It's a very, very large facility that probably originally was quite a beautiful glass-like structure. The space program people have traveled to the face on Mars, to the pyramids on Mars, and from what they've told me, these structures are there, but they are under a great deal of sediment. There was a massive catastrophe that hit Mars that wiped them out, and that is described in the Law of One as having happened approximately 200,000 of our years ago. And the planet that exploded, they said, was more like 800,000 years ago. So it's interesting to note that the shape of this five-sided pyramid has the human proportion built into it, suggesting it was built by humans who look like us. Because there's the Vitruvian man that just drops right in perfectly into the shape of that pyramid. Isn't that interesting? There's all kinds of very strange and wonderful mathematical relationships between this five-sided pyramid and the surrounding geometry on the plateau. I'm not going to bore you with all that, and we don't have enough time. That's Richard Hoagland's thing. I highly recommend reading his book, The Monuments of Mars, because that is the best source for all of that information. Then NASA comes out in 1998 and tries to debunk this whole thing by releasing what Art Bell called the cat box, in which they washed out the blacks and whites, they washed out the contrast, and sent us this image on the left to say, oh, oh, all these people that think it's a face, they don't know what they're looking at. That was disinformation, folks. That thing on the left doesn't look anything like what I showed you and the very beautiful shadows that it cast on the original NASA slides. Why? Because they don't want us to know that they already have a base on Mars. They've had it since the Nazis originally settled on Mars, believe it or not, as early as the late 1930s, early 1940s. The Nazis had already landed on Mars. They had some huge problems. They tried originally to settle around the equator, but there's these electrical storms that EMP'd all their systems, fried their systems. So now apparently the bases they build are around the North Pole, the pole top and bottom pole, but especially the North Pole. And they have a facility there on Mars that has 200,000 personnel and only 10,000 of those people are actually born on Earth. And it's ex apparently expanding very rapidly from what I've been hearing. So one of our earlier space program insiders, Henry Deacon, talked about this Mars city that they've got up there, which is one of the basic places that people end up going if you go into the space program. Now this is an enhanced image to show the contrast, but what we see here are these glass tubes, which may be lava tubes, but they're probably the result of intelligent construction for what would amount to underground trains because this civilization was an underground civilization they built after the surface of Mars had been largely destroyed in the explosion. They had a lot of facilities already there. The explosion probably blew up some of them and they built more. And then they built the face and pyramids and actually recolonized the surface of the planet. So these do look like glass. And that would be what we'd expect to see if they had gigantic underground boring machines that bored their way through all that material. So this civilization, this renegade group we call the progenitors, according to the military insider, Richard Hoagland's top insider, this military group, that this, I'm sorry, the progenitor people were on the run. They were criminals and they were sent to our solar system. This was their place of refuge and escape and they colonized our fourth planet, which is Electra or Tiamat. And this planet was where they grew to ultimately at least 100 billion people and probably a lot more than that. They were all in the 70 to 100 foot tall range. They're very large and a larger planet supports a larger body. So this all makes sense. So Mars would have been a much smaller moon compared to the size of this planet. Now, again, it was originally a moon, and then after the planet, it probably had some settlement while the big planet was settled, and then after the big planet totally exploded, some of the settlers on Mars survived. So that might be the size of Mars compared to the original super Earth. It was very large. So Tiamat or Electra exploded, 
And here's the thing. Our Earth's moon was the crown jewel of their entire collection. The moon was actually an ancient build-out. I have been told by almost everybody who's a space program insider across the board, the entire interior of our moon, all the way around, 360 degrees in every direction, 20 to 50 miles deep, and it's all hollow, and it's all loaded with rooms for these 70-foot-tall progenitor people inside. The whole interior of the moon. That trips me out. So there was, so th there was a last-minute effort to flee inside the moon. Apparently, billions of them managed to get in at the last minute. But the moon, even so, was heavily damaged as they fled. They, f they could drive the moon away from the damage. But the problem is... There were chunks of their original planet, which we now call asteroids, flying around everywhere. And they were getting hit. Boom, 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 boom. So they took a lot of damage, and a lot of that ancient base inside was destroyed. The moon was heavily damaged on the inside. There were bodies everywhere. It was horrible. They didn't have, they lost a lot of their technology. This is one of the things we've heard, is that after the moon went out there, they resettled on Mars, and th th they got shorter their height starts to drop. So this appears to be when they go down to about the 36-foot range and lower. So they lose their height, and they've got bodies all over the place inside, and it stinks, it's horrible, there's flies, mm, it's just disgusting. So they have to resettle on the surface of the moon by building domes out of that same glass or something similar that they could still do, and they rebuilt their civilization in glass domes on the surface. At this point, they had trees and plants and all kinds of cool things under the glass on the moon. So the moon was like a really nice place to live. And they start traveling to the Earth as giant humans compared to what was native on Earth, which was probably just like caveman. And they began creating huge cities. And as the tides on the Earth kind of jump-started everything and as the conditions got better, they eventually built an enormous civilization on Earth in what we now think of as Northern Africa. And that is the area that you see here as the Sahara Desert and Saudi Arabia, the whole Persian Gulf, and then on up even into the Carpathian Mountains up there. Now, there's kind of a problem here, isn't there? <laughs> what does it look like right now? It's like a big old wasteland of nothing. Well, it turns out that these people still could not get over their warlike ways. They still wanted to kick ass. They still wanted to kill people. And eventually their enemies came and wiped them out again. And one of the most fascinating things the insiders told me is, forget about even leaving the earth. If you're a treasure hunter and you want to find good stuff, all you got to do is have the advanced satellite technology they already possess and start digging down in the desert. Sahara. You could go as little as 40 feet down, sometimes up to two, 300 feet of sand down, and there is an extraordinary amount of technologically advanced artifacts down there. They're everywhere. The Egyptians then ended up eventually living on what was the surviving highlands, the only part that was left after this war, which was actually where the Great Pyramid is, where the Sphinx is, right up there, the top of the Persian Gulf, Right up there between Saudi Arabia and Africa, that little tiny part was the highest area, and that's where civilization clung to. Now, these people obviously got blown up. This is what I was told. And apparently they still survived. Some of their descendants still survived, and they've been keeping themselves a secret. So a lot of this stuff about the moon is stuff they don't want us to know because they're still afraid that they're going to be isolated and attacked. They still think we're going to treat them as villains and criminals and want to kill them. So this appears to be one of the reasons why all this evidence about the moon has been suppressed. And one of Richard Hoagland's insiders, this NASA engineer, Ken Johnston, was ordered to destroy all these original prints from Apollo that had things from the moon on them. And this is a conference at the National Press Club that they did that was covered by the Russian media. The American media wouldn't touch it. Now, NASA apparently concluded that we can't handle the truth. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
And just to make the point, I'm going <laughs> to show you him. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> okay, guys, sure. Nobody's screaming. Nobody's running out of the room. But it was decided that you couldn't handle the truth. So then what we have is this Brookings Institution report that said that mankind might topple if we were faced by a race of superior beings. So they felt that we couldn't be told because our civilization and our way of life would collapse. Now, one of the coolest things that Ken Johnston found out and other researchers that came after him was that NASA apparently used frame 4822 to store multiple versions of the same image. And when you ordered 4822, usually it came out black but what this guy Alex Cook started to do is he starts to order multiple copies of 4822. And apparently whoever was in the records room at NASA hadn't been vetted out on the idea that there's multiple versions of 4822 and was never told not to send them out. So as they ordered multiple versions of 4822, we get this building on the surface of the moon, one of the original buildings that these, the descendants of the progenitors built, it's still there, it's all made out of glass, tell me that that thing is some kind of natural formation. I don't think so. There's a reason why they hid this from us, and doesn't it sound a lot like that base on the bottom of Saturn's moon Enceladus? Notice again, I said that there was that ribbed pattern on the base, and then we see something looking pretty darn similar to that on the surface of the moon, probably made out of glass. Now, the insiders in the space program who I've talked to have said that there are all kinds of glass ruins still on the moon and they leave them intact so that people can go out and visit them and be reminded of these wars that they had millennia ago so that they won't keep making war with each other. On the dark side of the moon, which is never going to face the earth, right? Because the moon, even though the light moves across it, it's always facing us in the same direction. That back side is called the dark side of the moon. We never can see it unless somebody had a satellite that could photograph the back. Well, who has all the satellites? NASA. NASA was chartered as a defense agency of the United States government. So they, they have the right and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the need to classify information that they feel would threaten national security. So they don't want to tell you about this. This little dome is also on the same frame, 4822. And as you can see, this is one of those original glass domes, apparently, that is still there, that got out largely untouched, because what we've been told is that enemies of these people who were still making war came back again, they blasted the moon, they hit it actually with a projectile that was the size of an 18-wheeler truck going three-quarters the speed of light. And it hit that moon and it just damaged it like crazy, shattered all the glass, and apparently we think that the civilization around the Sahara Desert was wiped out dramatically at the same time. Now this is one of the interesting ones that Richard thinks is a dome where we enhance the contrast around this picture from Apollo 12 and look at that weird thing that we see behind him when you amplify the contrast. Now that's pretty trippy, however most likely that's just a lens flare so I'm not convinced by that one, I just want to be clear on that. But that just kind of gives us an idea of what might be there. But this one is really cool. On July 20th, 1965, the Russians sent a probe called Zond 3 to go around the moon. And as the edge of the moon was coming up, you see things like this tower that shows up. That tower is huge. You see it there in the middle of the diagram? And then over on, and then as it rotates a little bit more and the tower goes out of view, you get this big glass dome that shows up, and it's very clear. Now this is Edgar Mitchell in front of what may be a very massive glass superstructure because when you enhance the contrast, there's geometric patterns and straight lines and all kinds of weird looking stuff that you see up there above the moon. And especially as you see these different enhancements, and this is a paper I co-authored with Richard to commemorate him being picked up by the Russian media, you can see that it is very glass-like, especially on the bottom right. And you can see some of the facets inside the glass. Very, very interesting. This is another thing Richard found, which clearly looks like some sort of weird technological artifact like an antenna that has been built onto the surface of the moon. 
Here is another one in which uh, there was the sun setting, and as the sun set, the light temporarily caught these glass ruins, which normally there shouldn't be anything there above the surface. It should just be black space. But as the sun was setting, the, the sunlight hit the glass at the right angle that you see something like this. Now, the insiders have told me that when you look at it from, if you're in the space program and you're flying around the moon, you'll see towers that are kind of bent and twisted and bent over. And because of this impact was so strong, they're shattered, they're damaged, and a lot of the damage has been left behind as sort of like a museum memorial. And so every now and then, some of this stuff shows up. Now, this is another one that really trips me out. All the other arrows, you know, he's looking at the fact that there's some weird changes in contrast there. But this thing on the left is what trips me out. There's clearly some kind of rod, some kind of what he calls a structural support that appears to have bent, and it is lying against the mountainside there. Now, this is an undoctored, unretouched NASA photograph. Does that look like something that would be a natural formation to you? I don't think so. That looks like rebar or some kind of support beam that fell and landed on that little mountain there. And this is another image apparently taken by the Russians from the moon's surface. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's just that geological thing that happens when the lava bubbles up and it just happens to look like the ruined foundation of an old square building. No, no, <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. You having fun? Are you liking this? Is this tripping you out or what? You think you, was this a good idea to be here? I think so. All right. Now, this is the, this is the grand poobah of all of it right here. The largest plane on the moon is not an impact crater. Now here it says in the Nature Science Journal, gravity data suggest flats of volcanic basalt formed from tectonic stretching, which is a lot of gobbledygook to explain that there is a gigantic frickin' square made out of the craters that we see every time we look at the moon. When you look at it, you see that if you tilt it a little bit different from where we see it on Earth, you got the man on the moon there, he's got the big head, and then he's got that little trail of him throwing toys into his bag, right? That's what they always used to call it in the astronomy magazines I had. He's throwing toys into his bag, but the toy path over the top of his head there is actually the top of a square. And so what we're seeing here, and there's the space.com calls it a strikingly geometric shape hidden on the surface of the moon. That's that red box. That's a square. That's the angle of the moon as we see it from Earth. And they've known this, obviously, because they've been sending people up to the moon ever since at least Apollo and Mercury. Now they decide to tell us 40 years later? Why did they wait so long? You can't handle the truth, right? Well, now they think you can. So what is this really saying? When you see this huge frickin' square, or what they're actually calling a rectangular structure, this suggests that it's artificial, that somebody built it, that the moon might be a massive technological artifact. And look at that. I mean, that diagram right there, you see the square so clearly. It's just so obvious. Just like, as I said, these square craters on Eros 433, same thing. So that square literally covers a huge portion of the moon's entire surface, and it may be the exposed substructure of what is inside the moon as the dust gets blown off. It may be that it's almost like a balloon, and as craters hit the moon, they're bouncing off of this thing, kicking the dust up, and now what you see is the seas or the mares is the remaining superstructure once all the dust has been cleared away. And it definitely shows us the square shape in the underlying geometry that it was made from. So we were only told, humanity was only told that the moon has a gigantic geometric shape, a perfect square, as of October 1st, 2014. So it seems that somebody is doing disclosure deliberately and getting us to know things. And so this is the shattered leftovers like you're seeing here as the sun is setting on the horizon. The shattered leftovers of the glass that still can be seen. The entire northern third of Africa was completely wiped out 
in the blast, leaving behind what we now call the Sahara Desert. You dig down 40 to 300 feet, and there's all kinds of toys there. Now notice, this is the only part of the Earth that looks like that. Do you see that? It's this big, huge desert, like everything else has been undisturbed, and probably if you waited another half million years or something, you know, it's going to come back. But this is only about, we, we estimate, based on multiple insiders I've talked to and trying to thread it with what was said in the Edgar Casey readings and what was said in the Law of One, it appears that this happened 50,000 years ago, that this was the first big Atlantis on Earth that was wiped out 50,000 years ago, which both books, both the Edgar Casey readings and the Law of One, point to a major, major war around that time that took place. As I said, the highlands of the original civilization was Egypt, and so they then built out stuff over what was originally there. So the Sphinx appears to be a recarving of an older monument, and the Great Pyramid is built on a big, big ridge of rock underneath. So as I said before, there's tons of technological artifacts under there, 30 to 400, I have to change that data based on new information. And the Egyptian priesthood went around and found some of these old books from people who were out there in our solar system were losing light. That's kind of interesting. Uh, so maybe they're trying to tell me something that we're running out of time here. What, how, what, how much time do we have? We got, yeah, we're, we're actually nine minutes past where we would be. Anyway. Yeah, we got more to do, so. <laughs> So what we find out is that the Library of Alexandria in Egypt was the storehouse for all these archaeological expeditions they were doing, finding these books that were made out of pages of almost unbreakable material, like made out of something like Kevlar. And that the books were then stored in the Library of Alexandria, which once it was invaded by the Romans, they did a false flag and they burned only things like census documents and tax forms and kept all the good stuff and brought it to, guess where? The Vatican Library. So one of my oldest insiders, Dr. Pete Peterson, was invited to go to the Vatican Library and allowed to read some of these old books and he said that some of them had like barcodes on them and all it was was digital looking code on every page. Some of them had very elaborate images of spaceships and space stations and bases inside moons and all this stuff. And the Egyptian priests had been able to translate some of this stuff. And so there were also books of translations in ancient Egyptian language and Greek and Roman, things like this, of what the actual original books said. So the books tend to have a solid color on them, like you'll have a blue cover or a red cover that's all leather. The books tend to have a buckle on them, so you actually can buckle it like your pants to keep it closed. And again, most of the pages are kind of like an off-white color and they're made of some kind of indestructible material. There's also a whole series of books that are made out of metallic plates that have engravings on them. So this is something that's being kept in the Vatican Library they don't want us to know because it has the history of these people. Now, if you hear about the Illuminati, if you watch the movie Eyes Wide Shut, you hear about something called the Saturn Cult and the Festival of Saturnalia. Why? Because these people trace themselves back to the progenitors who had originally settled on Saturn. So if you look in Eyes Wide Shut when they're all wearing the masks, they do this dance where they go around in a circle, and that emulates the rings of Saturn orbiting. Because they trace themselves as the descendants of Saturn, and they believe that they're different from the rest of us, that they have extraterrestrial DNA that made them the gods. And that kind of is segueing into the next part of our talk. So there were a very small number of survivors when the moon was blown up and they got out with only, apparently the story is, the moon was so badly hit that only a few of their damaged spacecraft got out and their civilization on Earth was almost completely wiped out. So just a small number of them made it and they crash landed on Earth and they then interbred with humans, which they were specifically warned not to do. And this created what we call in the Book of Enoch, the fallen angels. Their offspring, their children most likely, the hybrids of their own form, which was about 36 feet tall, and native people on Earth became these 12 to 13 foot tall, 
red-headed, white-skinned humans, and white skin was not normal for the earth. And this is preserved in a book that the Vatican did not want you to read that wasn't even found until the 1800s, but it's very old. It's as old as the book of Genesis, called the book of Enoch. It's a very, very important text. And I'm going to be doing a lot more about this as I go on, probably writing it into my books. The Scottish explorer James Bruce discovered a copy, several copies of it in Ethiopia in 1773. It was translated in 1821. And Jesus quotes from this book in the New Testament, so he obviously thought it was pretty important. The key chapters are chapters 1 through 36 called the Book of the Watchers. And it says that this man, Enoch, was Noah's grandfather and that he lived for 365 years. So he was some kind of extraterrestrial. Enoch acts as a messenger for what appeared to be benevolent extraterrestrials who had threatened these people on Earth, the Watchers, with total destruction that became Noah's flood. But before the flood, before their civilization was wiped out again, because we're now talking about 12,000 years ago, the big Atlantean flood, they used Enoch as a messenger to kind of cut a deal with the, with the good guys, the benevolent ETs, and say, would you please not destroy us? In, the, in this book, the book of Enoch, it says that there was only 200 of them that descended. They became the fallen angels. Lucifer was one of the fallen angels, interestingly enough. He was the leader. The insiders I've spoken to have said it's probably a lot more than 200, that they had interbred here for some time. They had huge population numbers again, and this event, Noah's flood, completely wiped them out. It says in 7.5 to 6 that they were cannibals. They began eating us, and they begged God for forgiveness in 13.4, and they were turned down, obviously, <laughs> And then a great flood was created to cleanse the earth of these so-called watchers, which they're still pissed off about and still punishing us for all these years later. Because we, i.e. non-extraterrestrial humans, were God's chosen and they were the fallen angels, the cast outs. So now they feel like they need to get revenge on us and that we are the wicked and they are the just. And what does the Bible say? that the money will be taken from the wicked and given to the just. Well, that's how they justify the economic redistribution that they've done with things like the Federal Reserve, the IMF, the World Bank, and the Bank for International Settlements. Now you see why I wanted to leak this all on stage at once, okay? <laughs> Stuff like this. But some of these people never died out completely. In fact, they've been around up until very recently in some cases. Let's look at the example of Easter Island. Jacob Roganveen and C.F. Behrens, two Dutch explorers, visited there on Easter Island, first people from the West to get there, 1722. And when they got there, they saw 12-foot-tall white men with red hair that had long earlobes, just like you see in the sculptures. And then they were peacefully coexisting with the natives that were called Hamau Monoko. So you have these two different groups, Hanau Epe and Hanau Momoko, and the natives had shorter ears, darker skin, and a typical human height. So they actually, these giants actually spoke to the explorers. Apparently something happened afterwards where they were removed. And this brings us to a very interesting and highly controversial thing. It's probably going to get me in a lot of trouble, <laughs> which is the subject of stasis beings. What the heck are stasis beings? Apparently some of the oldest people who got to the earth, and this may be the progenitors, we don't really know. They had a very advanced crystal technology, and they left these crystal artifacts all around the interior of the earth, deep, deep underground, in underground bases and things like that, in some cases natural caverns. You have these crystals that in some cases will glow with a blue light, and they can actually effectively create a time bubble where time basically stops inside the bubble. So you can then get inside this bubble when you activate the crystal properly. And, and there's obviously some kind of like a, a timer so you can get set up properly and then wait for the time bubble to kick on. And then the time bubble essentially keeps you so that you only experience like a few weeks, but it could be thousands of years on Earth. Now, there are apparently at least a dozen different stasis being areas around the Earth as well as others where the crystals collapsed and didn't work. One of these stasis being chambers was found in Ohio, and I have now called it the Illuminati Disneyland. 
The reason why I say this is that you go into this, there's a river in Ohio apparently, there's a mouth down at the bottom, a big cave opening, you go in there, you walk in a long way, and then eventually what you see is a room, it's about 60 to 100 feet tall, it's a dome, it's got black tar painted around the inside, and in the middle are three sarcophagi that are in kind of a Y shape around this thing in the middle that's a big crystal hanging on these supports with four poles, four pillars. The crystal is glowing and there's some kind of time bubble that you can't get through. It has like a gravitational field. So they had to climb up the side and build like a scaffolding so they could look down and see what was inside these sarcophagi. And what did they see? They saw apparently perfectly preserved giant humans who were around 12 feet tall, three of them, all males with red hair, long beards, and of course, still in stasis and still sleeping. Yes, and here's the crazy part. All these Illuminati guys were going to see it and they were writing their names on the side of the cave <laughs> to kind of like tag it, you know, like graffiti. And the name that a lot of people at the higher levels hear, the most notable name on that wall, guess who it was? Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln saw the stasis beings at Illuminati Disneyland. Now imagine the power of being in this group where you are told that you are the descendants of these gods. And you can go to a site like this that has a clearly advanced technology for people in the 1700s or the 1800s, they didn't have anything like a glowing light. They didn't even have electric light. They just had fire. You have this glowing crystal suspended with these weird like wires or something hanging off of these four posts in the middle and these people in sarcophagi that are giants with red hair and they're still sleeping and they look like they could come back to life. So this is where the Illuminati legend came into play that, hey, these are our, our ancestors. These are our own family members. And the curious part is that different stasis chambers have been found all over the earth and in the different areas we find different types of humanoid extraterrestrials. They're not all the same. So it seems like multiple different groups found these time crystals and built stasis chambers and the belief also is that the crystals are programmed to end their stasis as this energetic activation takes place in our solar system. So the Illuminati belief also is that as we get to the end of the cycle, these beings will reawaken and that is the return of their gods. So it's a great story that they've obviously gotten really invested in. And some of this information appears to now be leaked because we have things like this. This video appears to be taken from one of these types of extraterrestrial visitors I'm going to show you the video now. He's in this weird being. Look at the eyes. It's got some kind of coins on his eyes. This is from Russia. You got this fish on his chest. It's got, look at that, cuneiform. Cuneiform writing on the fish, so it's Sumerian based. And you see he's got this winged eagle on his waist there. And he's inside a sarcophagus that is totally lined with gold. He has a beard. He has a crown on as well. And this is a being that is obviously mummified, but he's in a very, very good state of preservation, isn't he? I mean, now some of these stasis beings, apparently, they really do look very, very well preserved. So this is one example. And again, you see the cuneiform writing there. It's just like the Sumerians would have. But now here is another example, again, that was leaked from Russia. It's very likely that this is real. He may have been in the process of waking up um, and this was leaked to me through the insiders. It is online, but most people would have no idea what they're seeing. This stasis being has an, a beautiful crown on, as you can see here, and he looks fast asleep. Uh, apparently, he is waking up. He's got all these very cool solid gold artifacts around him, which we're going to see in the video in a minute here. And uh, this was apparently on the cover of the sarcophagus that he was found in. Looks of, like a very interesting combination of Sumerian and Egyptian iconography. Now, this apparently is true, that as he was, be, he, he was starting to become unfrozen, this is probably somebody from the inside that was doing this, or it could be a hoax, we don't really know. 
but he appears to have longer hair on his chest than we do, and his body is still soft, and it looks like flesh. You see that? This is very, very strange and creepy. I understand that. But these are the stasis beings. And so now I'm going to show you the video, and it's a long video, so it, it takes about uh, 3 minutes and 52 seconds. So we're not going to watch the entire thing. But I want to just check this out with you. So here's some of the Egyptian. You see that? It looks like an Egyptian uh, pharaoh, like a female pharaoh there. And now you see they have the uh, newspaper held up against his body for comparison. You can see there's this gold stuff over there on the left. Uh, and then look at all these statues that you got there. You got this weird looking guy on the left there with two serpents, one on either side of his uh, shoulders. And he seems like he's got a strange face. You have this Egyptian pharaoh looking woman coming out of a jar there. There's the guy with the funny face. Notice he has an elongated skull. You see the elongated skull on that guy there? And we're seeing that he's got a very long beard with nice brown hair. He's got this very lush golden crown that has uh, curious shapes and curious structures on it. Uh, here's the Arabic newspaper. And notice there's Sumerian cuneiform again on that gold plate that the newspaper has been put on top of. So now we're seeing it coming up from a different angle. Um, you can see the top of the sarcophagus there. You can see he's got an image of the sun on his headdress. Now this has leaked a few places online, but hardly anybody knows what they're looking at. I did have somebody send me this video before I knew what it was. I said, oh, I don't know, I don't know. But now I've been told this is almost certainly something that's genuine. Notice the date of the video is 2002. It's nothing new. So this has been held on reserve for a long time. And yet we're only now hearing about it 13 years later. So there's some sort of weird paper. And there you see he's got some kind of armband on his left arm. And it's got some Egyptian looking symbols on it. Now you can kind of see there's a big plate there with an Egyptian pharaoh woman on it. And a statue to the left. There's another good shot of his headdress that does appear to have feathers on top. Suggesting he might have come in a flying craft. And there you get a really good shot of the, w of the woman. She looks very Egyptian, doesn't she? And yet this is not supposed to be where the Egyptians were. So this is some very curious stuff. And again, uh, there's, I can't really make out, uh, it looks like there's a bird of fire on there, or the phoenix on that one. Now they again zoom in close on the Arabic newspaper. You see the Sumerian cuneiform on the metallic plate that's been put over his chest, the symbol of the sun there. Here's another shot of the metallic plate taken from a side angle and his chest. And it goes on from there. So you've kind of seen the whole interior now, so we'll just keep on going. So here's my bad joke of the night. We're going to give you a giant <clears throat> anthropology lesson. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so you saw there was a lot of Sumerian-looking stuff. Well, the Sumerians appeared to be quite giant, and this is where the Anunnaki story comes from. Here you have Inanna, and notice that she's got her foot on a lion, and the lion is a 9-foot cat. So you're looking at a 12 to 13-foot tall human here. No, she doesn't look reptilian. She has a human face, but that lion is dwarfed by her. Then you have this guy on the throne, and the guys on the left are dwarfed by him. Again, suggesting that the original people who were here, who were apparently cannibals in the, in the Book of the Watchers, were giants. Now, a lot of times on the old, old Egyptian walls, you see depictions of different types of humanoids, including humanoids with bird heads. These beings apparently are real, and they're called the avians. There are certain types of ETs that do have bird heads. They don't really look like that. This appears to be an oral legend, not based on eyewitness sightings, but there are actually people that have those bird heads out there. Notice, of course, here that in this temple, look at the height of the doorway. You see the people walking in? You see how much that dwarfs them? That would be perfect for these Anunnaki gods to show up. Now, the original Egyptian god Osiris apparently was very tall, had green skin, had an elongated skull that you see on that hat, and next to the Sphinx, he built this stone structure, the Osirian, as you see right here, which is made out of huge blocks, some of which are 100 tons. 
Notice that he is pictured with some of these people that have like the bird heads. There's an avian there on the right. You got a guy that looks like a native there who has brown skin. Then you have a woman on the left who looks really a lot shorter than Osiris. She's only about half his height compared to him sitting on that throne. And notice again, he has the elongated skull. So that's one of the original pharaohs. And over time, as they stay on Earth, the Earth's energy fields get to them and they lose their height. That's one of the first things that apparently happens. But for the most part, they retain the elongated skull. So Akhenaten, 15th dynasty now, so 15 generations after Osiris, they've gotten a lot shorter. He lost the green skin, but he's still got the incredible skull. This is a sculpture of Akhenaten. And notice that his hat actually looks like the edge of a UFO, suggesting that he came in a craft that was aerodynamic like that. Very interesting headdress. This is his wife, Nefertiti, drawn with an elongated skull. Another shot, apparently, of Nefertiti or one of their kids, maybe Ramses. Here's another shot of Nefertiti with the elongated skull. You'll see this happens over and over again. And then what, the, what do they do? They call this an artistic style. This is their daughter, Meritaten. Now, do you really think that if a guy was commissioned to do a royal sculpture and he screwed up the way your head looks this much, <laughs> and he cuts off all your hair and he doubles the length of your cranium to create this weird superhuman looking monstrosity if that wasn't the way they really looked do you think he would have gotten out of that room alive no you're seeing it and the Illuminati laugh at you because this is right out there at the German Museum the Berlin National Museum and people say oh it was just an artistic style no this is the big secret of the Illuminati this is their daughter thinking that it would look sexy to stick a piece of hair on one side of her bald head. I don't know. I think she ought to work on that look a little bit. I'm not really feeling it. Just call me crazy. Notice also this is uh, Nefertiti's body, that she has apparently a longer spine than we do and more weight around the midsection. They all seem to have this funny little pot belly and a very narrow rib cage. It's different physiology. They're not quite the same. There's another shot of them with this really narrow rib and then the funny pot belly. Now here we see on the right people with elongated skulls and on the left people bowing to them in supplication who have normal skulls. And notice that all the people with elongated skulls have winged discs that they're wearing on their heads suggesting that they got here originally long ago in flying discs and they are the descendants of the gods. The Illuminati trace themselves as the descendants of these people. Another strange place where we may have evidence of giants is the Cycladic Islands in Greece, the Cyclades, in which these weird sculptures show up that have no background, and they have these weird stylized heads. So here's a guy strumming some kind of harp or something, and notice the hat that he's wearing and the shape of his hands. This is actually Baal, the Roman god of uh, the underworld. We'll get to him in a minute. So here's this Cycladic figurine strumming some kind of musical instrument and they have this weird stylized look that again clearly suggests this is like an artistic rendering of somebody with an elongated skull just like you see right here where you have Meritotten's granite bust and then that shows what the hats that they wear would look like worn on top of her head. So here is the Roman god Baal, the god of the underworld. Now he was a giant. The eyewitness reports of Baal were that he was very large, 12 feet tall, and notice that he's got this ring around his elbow. That apparently is a technology that allows him to create telekinesis, to levitate objects, and to overpower people telepathically with his mind. So these sculptures are based on what people were seeing. And the one in the middle there is our good old friend from the Bohemian Grove. You know him as Moloch. That's right, the owl-headed god. So here he's got a bull head, but it's the same guy. So these people were wearing masks in some cases. They came here, and they were the giants, and they wanted human sacrifice. So look at this big guy on the throne, and there has been a war going on to stop this kind of bullshit from happening. And these people have now had their ass kicked. These giants are not on Earth anymore. We've gotten rid of them. But the war still isn't over. It's still ongoing. And apparently these giants, these Anunnaki, are still working through our governments and still trying to win this war that they now know they cannot win because it's too late for them. Once this solar system change happens, it's all over. 
So here's a few more images of this very giant warlord, this evil god that wanted human sacrifice ball. And you can see that in every image he has this weird elongated skull, just like you see with the Egyptian pharaohs. Now some of the good guys appear to be the ones from the Indian tradition. We have blue skin. Humans don't have blue skin, at least not here. The Maya have Quetzalcoatl, a white-skinned bearded god where nobody else had white skin. The Japanese were civilized by these folks called the Dogu, who look very different from us. That's an understatement. Plus, they're wearing some really cool space uniform. The Dogon, Dogu, Dogon, interesting. In Africa, this is a sculpture of them. Don't those eyes look awful familiar? So there's been a lot of ETs that have showed up all over the planet. The Australians have the Wangina. Oh, they got stuck with the bad end of the stick on that one, didn't they? We don't like those types. Get those out of here. Now I want to show you that in addition to these paintings and sculptures, we have actual skeletons. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Most of these represent the long age descendants of the original giants when they've gotten down to our human height now, but they still retain the elongated skulls. Look at that skull in the middle. Look at how much larger that head is than the others. There's nothing natural about that. That is a totally different form. And that one on the left, they're trying to say that that's the result of head binding? Yeah. Yeah, right. Just tie some boards on your baby's head when he's born, and you're going to double or triple the height of his skull. Yeah, I'm not buying it. <laughs> Something's going on here, folks, as you can see. These are the descendants of the giants. And this guy, Brian Forster, has been doing an amazing job of putting all this stuff together and finding new examples of these weird skulls. Now, even Discover Magazine... Mainstream science wrote about these so-called Boscop skulls in which they totally show the difference between a regular human skull and the Boscops, which would have a brain size twice ours, so the least intelligent of them would have a 300 IQ, and they describe how these skulls have been found all over the planet, and they say it appears to be some different type of human life. Here's another example of giant skulls, this time found in a place in Siberia called Omsk. The skulls were so abnormal, so weird and scary looking, that the guys who found them actually started crying and quit their jobs. And if you got a job in Russia, that's a darn good thing to have. So this is not something that normally would happen. But they were freaked out. Because as you can see by the guy holding that in his hand, there's nothing normal about that skull at all. This was taken from a documentary on television about King Tut, the real King Tut. Again, looking and seeing an elongated skull. And this is actually a shot of people who still have elongated skulls, Boscop characteristics, in Africa. Certain tribes apparently still have the elongated skull. And it says it is uh, <clears throat> censored. This is the only picture like it I could find. There's a little white box over her nipple that says censor, spelled S-E-N-S-O-R. <laughs> yeah, OK. I didn't do that. Okay, that's not me. Don't blame me. This is the only version of the picture I could find. <laughs> and here's another one where the baby has got a very interesting hair, braided hair, going way, way up its skull. This is not normal. Now, this is 14th century Italian nobility. Remember, the Illuminati have said that they are the descendants of the giants. Turns out this bloodline, the Diest bloodline, is the central root that connects to all the different European Illuminati families. And they come out of Rome. Well, let's take a look at a picture of these people who like to stay low and undercover and notice if there's anything a little bit different about them. Whoa. Now you see why I wanted to leak all this on stage at once? I was looking at this picture at the airport, and I looked around at everybody's head I could find just to see if anybody had that whoop, elongated skull at the airport. I couldn't find one dude or one woman that had this. Now, apparently, there's a lot of these types of people at the Vatican. They're called the Jesuits, and they wear those elongated hats at the Vatican, right? So they can walk around and blend in with the rest of us, and nobody suspects anything because they're always wearing the long hat to hide that skull. Okay, now these types of people will usually never run for office. They stay undercover. They stay in the background. We've had multiple insiders say that they have met with people who still have 
elongated skulls like this and are high level insider Illuminatus people. And again, they look like the Egyptian pharaoh skulls, same type of thing. The Huns, the original Mongolian invaders that conquered as they went to the west, also seem to have these elongated skulls and were descendants of giants as well. Now here's a series of Italian coins that all very clearly show his elongated skull. Most likely he's wearing a wig and he's bald, just like she apparently was bald. You could see she had hardly any hair. And the hairline on his wig doesn't look that good. It's just kind of like a straight line. So they didn't put a lot of work into this. It was the 1400s. I mean, cut him a break, right? So this is very unusual, but these, this was probably one of the last times these people came out in the open. So up until the 1700s, these giants were still walking around in America. And if you do some digging, the New York Times has some articles that show us these giant skeletons. November 21st, 1856, from the New York Times, we see the description of a skeleton that was found 10 feet 9 inches in length. December 25th, 1868, there was an expedition found in Minnesota by the St. Rippids Water Power Company, and they were quarrying rock, and they found a 10 foot 9 and a half inch tall skeleton and the bones alone weighed 364 and a quarter pounds. And they say the body must have weighed at least 900 pounds. So this was a giant. New York Times, September 8th, 1871. Here it is right here. You can look this up. They're still available on the New York Times website. Said that they found giant skulls where the bone itself was nearly an inch thick. Pretty crazy, and the body was eight or nine feet tall. There's nobody like that here now, not even basketball players. <laughs> New York Times, February 8th, 1876, as you can see right here. Uh, three skeletons were found nearly nine feet in height in this one dig. Then we have August 10th, 1880, and in this one we see that there were skeletons that were 11 feet three inches long when they were found. May 25th, 1882, this was a mound that was 60 feet in diameter and 12 feet high in which they found giant skeletons inside. November 20, and you're going to see this mound thing over and over again. There's lots of mounds that have been built in America. They've all been suppressed. We can hear a little bit about it, but the whole science has been erased by the descendants of the Cabal, Freemasons, Illuminati. They don't want you to know about this. There's mounds all over America, specifically in Ohio, Wisconsin, West Virginia are some of the biggest places on through Pennsylvania, even New York in some places, the New York State. So here we got November 20th, 1883. And in this case, they, they unearthed a seven foot skeleton in a 50 foot mound. And May 5th, 1885, as you see right here, a small mound, oh yeah, that was me working too fast. <laughs> A small mound in Ohio with four huge skeletons, seven to eight feet tall, inside the mound, along with a whole bunch of cool things that it had included. So these giants, when they died, they'd bury themselves in these mounds, and we're now finding all these giant skeletons, and this is published in mainstream news, February 9th, 1890. Here again, this is in Pleasantville, New Jersey now, and what we see here is is that they had a large mound with eight bodies, seven to eight feet in height, and over 50 bodies in the mound altogether. You're probably starting to ask yourself, where the heck did all these skeletons go? Well, the cabal created this thing called the Smithsonian Institution. And they say, oh, bring everything to the Smithsonian. We'll take care of it. We'll, it was the best false flag ever because the Smithsonian got all of those things, and now it is illegal to own or to publicly display any giant skeletons because it's considered desecrating Native American ruins. So there's a law on the books that makes it illegal for you to ever have any of these on display. August 10th, 1891, the Wisconsin Mounds, elaborate systems of defensive works, August 10th, 1881. And they're talking here about the Fort Aztalan Pyramid Mounds in Wisconsin. There's two straight lines of mounds. Each straight line crosses over in an X pattern, and they go across 50 miles. So this suggests a great deal of intelligence behind the way they were being built. 
and it forms a great St. Andrew's Cross. Well, St. Andrew's Cross, for those of you who don't know, is the official flag of Scotland, and it is based on St. Andrew, who was crucified and killed on the cross and apparently did ascend, hence he became a saint. And for, <laughs> for those in the audience who happen to be into BDSM, you may already know that BDSM practitioners love to get a beating on a St. Andrew's cross. So when I started Googling this up, I found lots and lots of pictures like this, and this was probably about the cleanest one I can show you. And by the way, he is wearing, what is that, SpongeBob SquarePants underwear? No, it's Scooby-Doo underwear. And he says on the blog post that his buttocks were completely purple after this young lady had lots of fun doing what she was doing. So he probably didn't want to sit down for a while, but I guess that was his enjoyment, so go figure. <laughs> Why does he put stuff like this in his talk? Well, I was going through and I saw it, so what the heck. <laughs> October 3rd, 1892. Got to lighten it up a bit. A race of giants in Old Gaul from London Globe. Now this is actually Scotland. And what we see here is... Scottish skeletons double the normal size of us in height. That means they're 12 feet tall in mounds found in Scotland. Then 1894, March 5th, we have giants found near Serpent Mound, Ohio. And the skeletons were over six feet in length, which doesn't sound that impressive to us now, but apparently some of them were a lot bigger than that. They were found with strange tools. Serpent Mound is probably the coolest looking remaining mound that these giants built while they had colonized America and they apparently at one time pre-Atlantean catastrophe had a huge civilization in America. That's what a lot of this stuff is, is Atlantean ruins. Now this is a drawing of the original serpent mound but an older drawing shows that both sides of the eye were there. That's very likely the left eye of the Illuminati that they were drawing. This is the same group of people with the same ancient religion. See that eye? That's the snake with the serpent's tail coming off of it. And this is what it looks like now. That mound is about 50, 60 feet tall. It's a huge thing. You can walk all the way around it. You see the roads for cars that have been built so you can drive around it and look at it. So a lot of work was put into this. And there's many, many of these mounds in Ohio, West Virginia, or where a lot of them are. It's all been covered up and suppressed. Tawanda Daily Review, October 25th, 1897. And this one says that you have a very large thigh bone where the total skeleton would have to be over seven feet tall in an Indian mound. December 20th, 1897 now, a Wisconsin mound again is opened with a nine, an over nine foot tall gigantic skeleton. Now some people get pissed off and they say, David, why are you going through so many of these? Well, I like to you know, give you the fact that there's a lot of data for the skeptics. That's why I'm, I'm going through it quickly here. The skull was half the size of half a bushel. A bushel is a really big barrel. So this thing was very large. Now we're getting towards the end of this now. September 7th, 1904. Uh, and this one was found, uh, let's see, in New York, actually, down around New York City, in employee of the Harlem Railroad. Near Purdy's Station, there was an immense mound that they obviously got rid of to build New York City that had several skeletons of unusually giant size, 1904. So they wiped that out. May 4th, 1908, giant skeletons found again. And this time, it's a cave in Mexico that had over 200 of these giant skeletons that were nearly nine feet in height. And they say that this race antedated the Aztecs because this was part of what was Atlantis before it was destroyed in the biblical flood it is reported in the Book of Enoch that was the Atlantean cataclysm. The femur alone reached up to the thigh of the guy who was doing this, and the skull was 18 inches long from the front to the back. So this was a very large humanoid. Then we have Washington Times, California, July 13th, 1908. And this one is of near and dear importance to all of us as Los Angeles uh, locals because they dug it up right out here on the beach. You can literally frickin' walk to the beach from this hotel. Literally walk to the beach. And right over there, they dug up 14 skeletons 
that were over nine feet tall each. So these people had lived right here, right where we are now. Three perfect specimens were brought to a lab in Santa Monica to be exhibited and studied scientifically. And of course, this has all been swept under the rug. And we find out that Catalina Island, which as you probably know, is directly right over there. You just take a little ferry and it's right down by the marina. You can take a ferry over to Catalina Island. It's a nice little vacation island that we have right here. People like to go to. Get a load of this. Three to six times larger than people now, they had double rows of teeth, red hair, and skulls three to six times the size of normal humans. There's Catalina Island. I can see it from my house, actually. Uh, this is in the late 19th century. And it says that they had dwarf mammoth bones that were roasted in ancient fire pits, eaten by human-like creatures who were giants and had two sets of teeth. And this is an article that basically describes what I'm about to show you here, which is that in Catalina Island, this is staggering, they found 3,781 giant skeletons, and the whole thing was covered up. They took all of them away, they're all hidden away, and what I heard from my space program people is that the, that the Illuminati, the Masons, at one point were destroying these giant skeletons left and right. They just take boats out into the ocean and dump the skeletons into the water. They didn't want anybody to find this. Now, however, they treat these as very valuable ancient relics, and you get in a lot of trouble if you destroy them. So they're still being found, and any time I've heard from some of my insiders, any time people start to find this, you're in big trouble now. You try to publish it, oh wow, we made an archeological discovery, look out. Because you're target number one, they're not gonna like this. This is not something that's gonna happen. Skulls up to six times the size of normal humans. Almost 4,000 skeletons found on Catalina. You'll never look at it the same way. I never look at it the same way after that. Now we're up to May 4th, 1912, one of the last ones. Again, Wisconsin, near Lake Delavan. And this one actually got coverage in other things. 18 skeletons found in this mound, in this case. And the head slopes straight back directly over the eye sockets, just like the Egyptian pharaoh heads. And this brings us to our next big thing. 1913, and we start to see the first of only very few pictures that ever have survived. And there's one of the pictures. Notice the elongated skull there on the left. Almost 10 feet tall, and they were found in caves in this case with elongated skulls. Now we're up to July 14, 1916. A mound that was found where in this case? Binghamton, New York. So this is upstate New York. 700 years ago is when it was found. And uh, we have another one here. From oh, this is the one that the article is talking about. It's actually in Pennsylvania. The article's from Binghamton. It was written in Binghamton. The actual mound was in Pennsylvania at Tioga Point, and they dug up 68 skeletons that were seven feet or more in height. And it was believed to have been buried 700 years ago, around 1200 AD. Then we're getting right to the end. September 21st, 1916, they wrote up the same finding in the Wellsboro Gazette. Again, it's talking about Pennsylvania, the mound. And there's another one, which is in France, that apparently goes back 25,000 years. We don't know much more than that. I'd have to do more research, but it says skeletons of giant warriors. And they found the head, and they believe them to be 25,000 years old. Others were found in 1950 in Ireland by archaeologists, Superman-sized skeletons, as you can see right here. So. This gets to the next big question, okay? Where are all the relics? We've got all these skeletons. Didn't anything survive? Aren't there any pictures? Isn't there anything cool we can look at? Yes. Thank God. I have done, I've combed the internet clean and found everything I could possibly think of. And there's not very many, but there's some that are pretty darn cool that I found. So this is from the San Antonio Express, early 20th century. And this is uh, the skulls, and you can see, look on the right there, that one on the right is a lot larger than the ones on the left. The other two are of normal size. So you notice large cheekbones, really large, bulky jaw. And this, as you can see, you have a, a normal skull on the right there in the, in the middle, that's number two. Number one is one of these giants, really big jaw, 
much larger, and notice the shape of the skull. You got that elongated skull again, folks, except now they're a lot taller because these are the earlier ones before they interbred and their height keeps dropping. Now we have skulls of the Incas, which as I was showing you before are what happens once the height starts to drop. We saw lots of cool examples of those. These are more of our own height. Another one that is a photograph that we found, this is one of the mounds before it was destroyed. They're starting to excavate the structure. A lot of these mounds do look like pyramids, but they're made out of dirt. Many of them have been destroyed, plowed over, or just ignored as mountains. There's still a lot of them in Ohio, and as I said, West Virginia, which hardly anybody lives in West Virginia. It's a lot of empty land. So in this mound, they apparently found a molar, a big tooth. And this is the guy pointing to what they apparently proved was a molar. Look at how large that thing is compared to one of our teeth. That's pretty wild. This was the grave site in the mound that they found. This is a drawing of it that had a giant skeleton inside that enclave. Now, in South Africa, Michael Tellinger has been always showing us this giant footprint that he found. This is probably one of those 36 foot tall, one of the oldest ones to come here, way, way back when they had first driven the moon into Earth's orbit and they started to settle on Earth. That's probably the types that we're talking about, or maybe even before they really settled. Then we have Cleveland National Forest. Somebody found a footprint there from a giant human, obviously a lot larger. And of course, we have another footprint from Mount Blanco, Texas, with a nice picture of Coca-Cola, which, you know, if it was California, it would probably be green juice, but uh, it's Texas, what do you expect? <laughs> Very large footprint, which is totally to be expected. Now, we actually have some mummies that have been found. This one is Irish, 11 feet tall, that they put inside its own little sarcophagus. This apparently is a real image, and it's almost twice the height of us. Now, the Freemasons used to collect these and had galleries, and a couple of their pictures probably were originally held in private collections and then got leaked. So here's a Masonic photo that was probably never meant to be seen by people outside the Masons, and notice how tall that skeleton is compared to him. And there's the two pillars, the Masonic lore, Boaz and Joaquin. And then notice also there's another extraterrestrial skeleton on the left there that's very short. So this probably was never supposed to see the light of day. And here's actually the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth, visiting the giant skeleton. Again, probably never was supposed to see the light of day. This nine-foot mummy was found in 1895 in San Diego. And here was a newspaper illustration of it, of a guy posing next to it, about nine feet tall. And there is an actual photo, a real photograph, of the mummy. You can see it had long hair. And these were believed to be an Indian tribe because they mixed in with the Native Americans. And apparently they stopped being cannibals in some cases so they could stay alive because if they acted like cannibals, they were going to get killed off. They'd get scared into caves and killed and eaten. Or just killed. Probably not eaten. That's their job. That's what they were doing. Here's another example of a very large mummy, and the human probably only goes up to her waist. Oh no, she's not quite that tall. There she is in the sarcophagus there. So she's probably more of like a seven-footer, but this is one of the mummies, again, that we find. Now here's a guy, this is really interesting, this is another probably eight-foot mummy, something like that. She's about two feet taller than him with her head off to the side. Notice the skull. You see something odd about her head, folks? You see how wide that skull is? Does that look like one of our skulls? Heck no! That skull is really wide and obviously it extends out into the back. So this is one of the best examples that we've got that survived showing that gigantic skull. Now, this is a write-up from that same finding, and we don't have time to go through all this. This is another one that was found in Europe, and again, there's not very many of these, but here you have a series of razor clams that have been put over the eyes. Now, the razor clam usually grows to be about this big, okay? So if you understand that and you look at this, those eye sockets are literally about five inches tall. So this is a very large head that the razor clams just happen to give us a size reference for. Here's another one that was found in Oregon. 
Again, you can see uh, this is probably based on some of the signs and the things. It looks like it's about double the size of anybody else's skull. All of the museums that have had these on display, they've all been contacted. They've all been silenced. They've all been threatened. Unfortunately, there's no place you can go to see the real thing anymore. Uh, and then this one is really bizarre. This was a guy who actually went to Egypt and a grave robber in 1998 found a mummy of a truly gigantic human with green skin and just hacked the finger off and actually allowed this guy to film it and he wanted to come back and buy it but he wasn't able to do so. And so what you're going to see here is how freaking large this finger is because there is an Egyptian pound. That's about, it's actually bigger than a $20 bill, it's taller. So the whole finger is literally like about this long. So those hands would be huge. This has got to be one of those original Osiris type 36 footers like the original Sumerian Anunnaki that this grave robber happened to find. Unfortunately, we never heard from him again. So, <laughs> surprise, surprise. So here's another shot of Osiris, those types. Notice how much taller he is than the woman that is standing behind him. Sitting down, he's already the same height that she is, so standing up, he'd probably be almost twice as tall. That's probably one of those types. So again, here's the size comparison chart of the different types that have been found on Earth, going from six feet all the way up to 36 feet in height. And this is a reconstruction, another one of very few that have survived, of one of the femur bones that was found in one of these giant digs this guy was around 14 to 16 feet tall, so that's a very unusual one, bigger than usual. But that's the first shot I ever found years ago of this kind of phenomenon. And this is also apparently real from a, a Middle Eastern dig of some of their original battle axes that the giants used to hold and carry. And this, believe it or not, is actually a diagram where every single one of those purple pushpins is a different documented site. This is done by researchers that have compiled all this together. Every one of those purple dots is where one of these giant skeleton sites were found. So they had extensively colonized the Americas at one point. So I hope you can see that what we're dealing with here is a very fascinating investigation that is far-reaching in scope, that has huge implications for what's going on in today's world. And all of the things that I'm telling you are part of this long-term battle for the future of the human civilization. What are we going to do on Earth? Where are we going? This geometric energy that we're made from has been around the whole time, and there's lots and lots of different people out there in the cosmos. We are made to ascend. The Illuminati cabal claims to be the descendants of these giants that were extraterrestrials, and I've now charted out the whole history that's never before been presented to the public. What you have just seen here is the very first time that anybody outside of a small circle of elite has ever gotten to hear and see the information that I have just presented to you. <laughs> yes, indeed. Where do I think all this is going? I think that we are on the threshold of a supernatural change in human evolution. And I'm going to be doing more of this kind of work as time goes on. You can read my books, Source Field Investigations and Synchronicity Key. Check out my show on Gaim TV, Wisdom Teachings. It's a half an hour a week. And tonight, actually, believe it or not, is the night that the 100th episode aired of my show. A hundred half hours. So, none of the stuff that I just showed you is on Guy TV, and it's getting harder and harder to outdo myself now, because so many of the conferences that people used to pay $300 to see are all free on Guy TV now. At least the 10-day trial is free. Then it's $9.99 a month. So anyway, there's a lot more to discuss, and I've done so much work. You can read my articles. I've done arguably more free stuff than anybody else in my field. There's a whole book on my website called Financial Tyranny, read by 1.5 million people. That's free, 
totally exposes the Illuminati, all the stuff they're doing with the financial system. And the subject of the Ascension is really big. I want to thank all of you for coming here. This has been totally awesome. I'm still alive. We made it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm your host, David Wilcock, and we are delving deeply into the world of the cosmic, which is 35 levels of need-to-know information above the President of the United States. They had a message for us. And the information is so wildly bizarre that everything that we thought we knew gives us hardly any preparation for what we're about to learn from this remarkable new insider who has decided to come forward and share what he knows with us none other than Corey Good. We'll be able to create whatever reality we like.